Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 480. Science Faction, your weekly Corona update. The numbers are as follows for today, August 30th, 2020. Infections worldwide, 25,377,704. Infections within the U.S., 6,173,229. Deaths worldwide, 850,149. We are closing in on a million worldwide deaths. And because of the caveat I usually give about these numbers not being 100% accurate, to be honest, we're probably past that. And deaths within the U.S., 187,224. Notice these ebbs and flows of the differences when I'm speaking to you each week, especially relative in terms of the U.S. versus everybody else and how fast everything is going up. And it's interesting to see this kind of up and down roller coaster of an event. All right, well, let's get on to this week's Corona news. I had to cover this first one because it's just such an example of just dumb fuckery causing like some actual tragedy uh but i will just make fun of it as if it's funny so there was a you guys might have heard about this there was a big super spreader an event a wedding in maine at the big moose inn which by the way everybody going there should have already known there would be trouble given the white trash element that would hold a wedding at a place called the Big Moose Inn. But anyway, so a bunch of redneck white trash people got together at the Big Moose Inn. And even though the state had said you couldn't have gatherings of more than 50 people, there were 65 people at the actual wedding itself. The Big Moose Inn didn't have any problem with that. And then given the other people there just on a normal weekend night, there was over a hundred people in this place. So of course it became a super spreading event. Something like 80 people caught it that night, but then have since passed it on to other people. We have now at least 123 people confirmed who have been infected just from that event, meaning they got either infected that night or they were somebody who got infected by their partner who came home, that kind of thing. And at least one person has died. Way to go, white trash wedding. Normally, I think murder is like the 10th anniversary gift, right? That's the one where you you give your partner a dead body. You got to do it on the very first night. Congratulations. Didn't even have to wait for the first anniversary for this. I use this as an example. Now, listen, obviously, I'm making fun of these people, and I'm sure they're probably decent people. Maybe I don't know who the fuck there was a 100-person wedding in the middle of COVID. They're, They're white trash. But regardless, here's the point. And this is something that I've made with the flu, but it's something that I think is really important for this. These people are not innocent of that death. Right, We're all going to say, oh, this is just a circumstance. They couldn't control it. Yes, they could. They could have not had 100 people in that place, which anybody would tell you is a dangerous thing to do. They chose to do it anyway because they're selfish, and they killed a person. They killed a person. It wasn't an accident. An accident is something you can't predict happening. It was the logical conclusion to stupid actions. And I think we're not seeing enough of these consequences. I see this especially in my younger friends. Like, we're in an age group where the likelihood of any of my peers personally dying from this is very, very, very low. The likelihood of somebody in my parents' generation or somebody there dying from it is quite high. Some of the numbers I was just going over, my parents are both in their late 70s. In the age group of late 70s, the numbers that just came out this week out of a thousand people in their mid mid to late 70s who get the disease, we expect 116 to die. That's an 11.6 death rate, right? No, so those any of you guys who have two parents out there like I do, I'm lucky enough to have both my parents alive. That means that if your parents caught this disease, you would have close to a one-fourth chance of at least one of them dying. And as we've talked about before, just not dying isn't beating this disease. A lot of times it has long-lasting permanent effects, organ damage, other things. So almost certainly there'll be some long-lasting effects, but about a 25% chance one of them will die. I want you to keep that in mind every time you're walking around and you see somebody without a mask. Because what that person is saying is, the death of older people is really not a concern to me or the death of immunocompromised people, the death of people who are walking around me who might have cancer. That's just not a concern. It doesn't really bother me. These are real death numbers. I get it. All of us running around here in our 20s, 30s, 40s, we're probably not going to die. But what if you're not that? I mean, 
have we become a nation of sociopaths that just goes, well, fuck the elderly and people with cancer and HIV? Like, it's such a weird thing to watch this country devolve into masks are impairing my freedom and I have the right to murder old people. Now, if we compare that with other stories that came out of some summer camps this week, they're really interesting. They're, those are very promising. They have really good testing methodologies. The, there was three particular case studies in which they followed these entire summer camps. They tested everybody, camp counselors, kids, everybody, before they left. And then if you tested positive, you couldn't go. And then once everybody got there, they tested everybody the second they got off the buses, and then they isolated them in small groups of 14. Well, it turns out they had three people, staff or I think between staff and, and students, test positive. But they were able to quarantine them and everybody they were around, retest them, isolate them until they were done. And guess what? Nobody else caught it. The only three people who had the disease were the three who showed up with it. Now, they didn't test positive on the way there, so maybe they caught it in between or the time they got tested, it, it was too close, whatever happened. But this was done perfectly. It was done with backups after backups after backups. We'll test them before they leave. But in case they get sick in between when they get tested and when they actually leave, we'll test them once they get there. And just to make sure that they're not spreading the disease when they are sick and we don't know, we're going to isolate in between those times. All of this, all of this should be a model for how we're doing stuff. Listen up, Big Moose Lodge. Next time somebody wants to throw their PBR-themed wedding at your place, maybe institute some of these policies. A real quick story I wanted to touch on. This isn't necessarily a science story, but uh, President Trump gave his speech the other night at the Republican National Convention, and in it, he spoke about COVID and about the vaccine process and about how he will have a vaccine by the end of this year and maybe even earlier. Now, that's possible. There's a possibility we will have it. I don't see this being, you know, really rolled out until the first quarter of 2021. But for those people who are worried about, does that mean they're going to rush it? Again, we talked to them a little bit about this last week with the idea of the Russian vaccines and kind of the different processes. And we go through phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and they go through a trial where like Putin throws something at a dartboard and then yells like, huzzah, and, and it's approved. Like we do still have a structure to things. And I'm sure political pressure can be put on that structure, but in the end, the structure stays the way it is. And I'm also curious how much political pressure can be put on somebody who isn't sure if you're going to be the person who can have political pressure in a couple months given the election. So I don't know how, how that it's all going to go. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert, but I can tell you the checks and balances are there. And that it would be pretty hard, even given political pressure, to push out an unsafe vaccine in America. So I had a few people kind of hit me up after Trump's speech, and they asked what my opinion was. Here's my opinion. It's more grandstanding. It doesn't mean anything. There's no actual facts behind it. The vaccine will come when the vaccine is ready here and when it is safe and can be proven effective and all of that stuff. I don't really think we need to worry about, you know, the executive branch somehow mobilizing vaccine production in such a way that they put an unsafe vaccine out for a whole bunch of people to use to try and win an election. Uh, not saying that they wouldn't try that. I just don't think it's possible given the system that we have. Another interesting article came out from Yale this week, and this is a big one because it starts looking at the differences between men and women. First, it breaks down who's actually in danger of dying. And overwhelmingly, like we've been told before, it is people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that, that age range. There is also some stuff below six that seems a little bit hairy, but basically from six on up, there's a lot more protection. Again, should be noted, organ damage, long-term damage, all of this neurological damage, all of this stuff means that just because you survive it doesn't mean that you're okay. But regardless, the other big one is men versus women. And we've talked a little bit about this before, but it was really quantified in this study. And you, as a man, are just much, much more likely to die of this disease. Now, again, these are all, in general, older men. But, you know, compared to a woman of the same age, you are much more likely to die. And so they wanted to investigate why. And they found that there was a different response between men and women, a different immune response to these diseases. Women tend to produce more targeted T cells, which, especially early on, are a good indicator of how bad that disease is going to get. If you produce enough good targeted T cells, that little, those little immune cells that go in attack whatever is coming in, then you tend to have a good response associated with good outcomes in the end. Men tend to produce more cytokines, which are a different immune cell. And it's, again, less targeted, more like a mortar blast, like we're just going to try and kill everything there. And we think what's happening in a lot of men, a lot of older men, might be a cytokine storm where their immune system is essentially overactive. 
it floods into that area and the immune system itself is what causes you to die like it, it attacks your body around you and yeah it's trying to attack the virus so the vi virus is a proximal cause but your immune system is the the direct cause of you dying so it might be that that inherent difference between men and women's immune systems where women produce better targeted T cells right off the bat and men tend to produce more cytokines, that might be why we see these gender differences in deaths. You know, it's the idea of a sniper rifle versus a mortar. And a mortar is great in some instances, but uh, not great if you don't want to kill everything around that mortar, which in this case happens to be your body. An article that came out that I... First of all, I, have, I hate except to quote IFL Science, which I hate, but they literally got the scoop. The writer there was the person who wrote this. God, this is a sad one. We have talked about the Andamanese Islanders before. They are part of one of the earliest migrations out of Africa, the same, part, the same group of people who made up the Aboriginal Australians, the New Guinea Highlanders, very ancient migration out. They are this island that's way off the coast of India, and they've essentially been uncontacted for like 40,000 years. Like every once in a while a sailor shows up, but they murder the shit out of people who show up on their islands, and uh, that has served them well and has kept them somewhat private. You may remember a year and a half ago or so when a Christian missionary, like he, he illegally tried to go to the islands and they killed him. And uh, usually that has done well for them because their population has been wiped out by disease in the you know 1800s and stuff before in previous contacts. So keeping people people away from them is probably good. Well, the report just came in that 11 of the islanders have tested positive for COVID-19. That's out of a population of 50. Given that I'm sure it's pretty hard to explain social distancing to them, they're probably all going to get infected. And given the low, low levels of immune response they have to, to essentially everything, much less coronaviruses in particular, that is really sad. We might actually watch a culture die out, one that's been isolated and lived on its own for 40,000 years, one that has a history and a language and, and everything that's so diverse from everything else you know and is just so different and this beautifully preserved Paleolithic culture just snack dag in the middle of the Indian Ocean and we're really at a, a possibility of losing it over this. And my question is, how the fuck did it get there? Again, it was an IFL science article, so it doesn't give you any details, but like, what asshole is going out there first of all you're not supposed to be going out there anyway so i don't know it must be a researcher or something and if it is a researcher the fuck are you doing man you don't know what's going on you're just gonna go wander onto an island in the middle of covid you don't care like fuck i i took some anthropological ethics back in the day for for regular cultural anthropology stuff you know like ethnographies and stuff and even then when you're going into a place with not it's not even uncontacted when you go to a place that has low contacted people you're supposed to go through quarantine periods this is pre-covid you're supposed to do this for the flu and the cold and all this shit because your regular diseases can hurt people who the fuck infected these people? Super, super sad news. I, I want to figure this out. I want to be the uh, like the cultural anthropology version of John Wick and just go like double tap headshot on anybody who's going on and killing these fucking islanders and this history, this continuity of history that's lasted for 40,000 years that we might have just wiped out because some asshole coughed on them. All right. Lastly, I hate to end these shows on a downer. I try and use them on an upper, but this was too important to let go. Uh, we now have very conclusive evidence. In fact, the first evidence for sure in the United States of a person who got reinfected having already been infected. Super shitty. This also, by the way, isn't a mild infection either time. He got infected, I think, back in April the first time. This is a 25-year-old, so not an old dude. 25-year-old from Nevada, got infected like in April, got pretty sick, diarrhea, cold, cough, like the whole nine yards, and cleared up after about 10 days. He got two negative tests and then just recently tested positive again. Now, we've talked before. There have been a few cases of this happening in Europe and China and stuff, but all of the second cases were all asymptomatic. Like they got it the first time. They technically had it the second time, but not a big deal. This time, it was even worse the second time. So he was symptomatic the first time. He was extra symptomatic the second time. This freaked people out because they're like, fuck, what happened? Did he just not get better? Is this really a second reinfection? Because if so, we're going to have to rethink a lot of our we're immune shit. What is this? So, so we actually looked at it. We did samples of the two different viruses that he had been infected with. Luckily, they still had samples of his blood from his original infection. And they found genetic differences that indicate, no, no, no. He didn't just have this in his blood the whole time and get, you know, it just sprang back up. This is a new version. He caught this one from somewhere else. That means you can catch it twice. That's fucking terrifying. 
That's hor That's so fucking terrifying. The only good thing right now is that people who have had it, we thought, couldn't get it again. And that makes for a very different situation than if you can just keep getting it nonstop. Now, this doesn't mean you can keep getting it nonstop. Obviously, we have a lot of evidence to show you have some kind of carried over immunity once you get it. But this is really scary because this guy definitely got it twice. This was not a reinfection. This was not a false negative test. wasn't anything like that. And he's young. And the second case was symptomatic, which means that this can happen in normal, healthy, young individuals. That is scary. And I actually wonder if maybe he got a different strain that is specifically likely to infect you if you've already had, if you've already been infected. I don't know, but uh, super not great news on that particular front and makes me want that uh, vaccine even more than Trump does. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me for Science Faction 480, where you learned all about how white trash weddings kill, but summer camps have it figured out. Why you probably shouldn't worry about Trump's vaccine push. Why men get sicker with coronavirus worse than women. How some isolated islanders may end up getting wiped out by some assholes who hadn't figured out quarantine. And how we had the very first case in the United States of a confirmed reinfection by SARS-CoV-2. Thank you so much for joining us and come on back later this week for Science Faction 481. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.